I first started having writing done. This is off. This is not part of the paper. I just something that may be useful to say. I realized that um, people that began to write about my work. It was all wrong and awful, and I, it bothered me a lot. And um, and the ones even the ones interested and who were smart, um, they were all dedicated. They were all the the critics supporting and engaged with the minimalists, like Solowit, Lucy Lepard, for example. Um, and uh, she has a famous book, and she's a great person, but her view was, in fact, they even called conceptual art post-minimalism for a while, to tell you how wrong it was. They should have called minimalism pre-conceptual, but they didn't understand. But, so, I figured out very young uh, that there were three ways we put our ideas of art into the world. Uh, the first, the primary one, is you make works of art, right? Secondly, we theorize, we make, write texts about art, and we get a dis, we support and engage a discourse about art. And that's another way. Implicit in that is a model of art. Thirdly, is you teach. You have, you have to figure out what, at a moment in the history, you tell a young artist they must know to be an artist. And um, so I began teaching, uh, I was about 22, and... Um, I had this bizarre experience where my um, I was in, I was I was in a class and I was hired to be teacher the next year and I had half of the class in the same full of students of the year before. It was difficult, but we managed it. But um, so I've always taught and I've continued uh, being a professor in some art department or art college, wherever. I'm at Goldsmith now. I have the endowed chair there. Um, so that's my apology for writing art theory, too. <laughs> the aesthetic, as a quote from Jacques Rancière, the aesthetic regime of the arts does not contrast the old with the new. It contrasts more profoundly two regimes of historicity. It is within the mimetic regime that the old stands in contrast with the new. In the aesthetic regime of art, the future of art, its separation from the present of non-art incessantly restages the past. And here's a quote from Gilles Deleuze. If one tries to play this game other than in thought, nothing happens. And if one tries to produce a result other than a work of art, nothing is produced. The game is reserved then for thought and art. We must first begin with an understanding that there is not one conversation in play about representation, but several. Our options are not limited to one choice, but to all of them. Indeed, this heterogeneous location of our view is the play between these points of view, one with its own context. Our productive activity, even, uh, shall we even say, our creative process, has as its objective not merely considerations for our future production, but also for our creative view of our reading of the past. So the burden of representation being put in play here, upstairs, is the necessity of art to break in the experience of its own time and not simply of the past, from those inherited meanings of representation which are now part of how we see. The present exhibition, Sigmund Freud and the play on the burden of representation, is the most recent addition to a series of works that goes back to the beginning of my practice in one form or another. But two installations of mine done in the early 1990s, the play of the Unsayable at the Vienna Secession and the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Russell, Brussels for the Wittgenstein Centennial and the play of the Unmentionable for the Brooklyn Museum in New York were the first large institutional versions of my curated installations. And they were done among other objectives with the intention of rupturing the status quo of how exhibitions are made and doing that by raising the questions about the habituated, habituated institu uh, institutionalized approach to the construction of an exhibition. It is important to note that I'm not an art historian, nor am I a curator. I'm an artist, and we will consider here what such a difference means. Since the beginning of my practice as an artist, I've made it clear that it is my belief that the primary material of an artist is meaning, if only its cancellation. 
and thus in my work, linguistic relations between objects and images and language itself has had a primary role. Forms and colors, for example, are a used up approach to art making, even though they may continue to be present and used for other purposes and having other meanings than they have had traditionally. A result of this understanding has often meant that the material of the work has been the context itself. At the time the Vienna Secession asked me to do the Wittgenstein exhibition, they pointed out that the Secession is perhaps the only museum in the world with a board comprised of artists. For this reason, it was their feeling that it would be most appropriate if the Wittgenstein Centennial exhibition would be organized not by an art historian or a philosopher, but, but, but by an artist. It was with this perspective that I felt important questions could be asked about both exhibitions and art, if an exhibition would be a work of art itself. My appropriation of the exhibition format as a form for my work clearly does change the experience of when it is a work itself. The most relevant questions about art recovered from modernism and which comprise much of postmodern practice remain ontological ones. If the exhibition you are seeing is a work itself comprised of other works, what is the difference? An important difference is that the artist, due to the nature of their activity, takes subjective responsibility for the surplus meaning that the show itself adds to the work presented in it. A major aspect, traditionally, of the art historian's practice involves objectifying what is essentially a subjective activity. And this is done by masking it with the authority of science, which our university system traditionally anoints art historians with, um, with, uh, with, given that the exact sciences are the models used and the basis of university knowledge. While it is certain that scholarship and connoisseurship play an important role in the assessment of historical works of art of previous centuries, but when we approach contemporary art, our priority should be more an informed understanding of the artist's intentions with that interface with the work's reception by the viewer. Instead, art historical practice, rather than the imposition of such judgment and objectivity. The effect, something, I lost a sentence here, and I'll never recover it today, okay. The effect of such an authoritative voice on our understanding and appreciation of a contemporary work of art is not a productive nor positive one in most cases. What is left out and experientially transformed by the perceived need to construct a cultural autobahn of masterpieces, as important as that is for validation in the art market, is clear, it clearly has as its mission the glorification of a particular cultural history, and thus a particular social order. The experience of the public of surplus meaning taking this form is clearly most often simply authority itself, with the result being naturalized and viewers depoliticized as they are distanced from the meaning-making process. What is denied is their own cultural political moment, something no longer available at that point in the cultural act of looking and thinking. My intentions in forming a curated installation for the Wittgenstein Centennial was not to promote an historical view nor engage myself with the crafting of history. Indeed, my goal was the contrary. I invited the viewer to participate with me in the reading and experience of the play of the meaning my juxtapositions <coughs> produce. Importantly, I did not mask the event of my juxtapositions or my authorship in doing it, nor did I make claims of validity, value, or importance pertaining to the integrity of the individual works used in my installation. This, of course, all applies to the exhibition of stairs as well. The point is that in viewing the relations between works provided by a context of meaning constructed by an artist, the viewer, in effect, has an invitation to participate in the meaning-making process, and by doing so also participate, participates in a discourse permitting them to experience the process of making art itself. Keep in mind that rather than eclipsing the integrity of works by the individual artists, um, by individual artists, I was told by many viewers of both the Wittgenstein and Brooklyn installation shows that experiencing works put in play, as I did in my curated installations, articulated difference in a way which made the individual works, as works by specific individuals, more visible rather than less, and articulated the terms upon which 
Each individual work was made for each artist. Such work then, released from being signposts of authority, are seen as a result of an artist's thinking. That is as a process, and therefore more accessible. I feel these installations provide the viewer with a sense of how art is made, and indeed, how artists think. That surplus meaning, which is my work, is in the choice of works and their form of presentation. All that which goes into that installation, which includes both the zero knot, wallpapered walls, as well as the juxtaposed works by other artists. And it is not unlike a writer's claim of authorship to a paragraph, comprised as it always is of a new use of old words invented by others. The point understood concerning Deleuze and Guattari is anti Oedipus, has Oedipus playing the role of representation and becomes, quote, a form produced at the end of a long genesis which defines the structure of representation, end of quote, and the beginning of another one. And that, by emphasizing the product rather than the process of production, we end up completely misunderstanding both. Nothing could better sum up a view of the art market's conservative effect on our experience of art and the message being sent to young artists about the nature of their chosen practice. In the logic of sense, Deleuze writes that, quote, two types of knowledge have often been distinguished, one indifferent, remaining external to its object, and the other concrete, seeking its object wherever it is. Joe Hughes has explained that these two types of knowledge are the two types of representation, dead and living. One empty and external to its object, the other concrete, and which comes undone when its object escapes it. Deleuze continues by saying, quote, representation attains this topical ideal only by means of the hidden expression which it encompasses. That is, by means of the event it develops. There is thus a use of representation without which representation would remain lifeless and senseless. This is the legitimate use of representation. The representation is linked to its concrete, life-giving conditions of production through the event or idea. The idea fills this role by acting as a sort of transcendental object, that is, in fact, often simply called the object in the idea, or the virtual half of the object. The material of an installation is, first, a psychological and social experience provided by the room's architecture. This results from the meaning of the social and cultural history of its use along with the combined experience of the psychology of that particular architectural context added to our prior architectural experience. We know an experience that while we also know we are standing in the world. We also know in a museum or a gallery that, like anything else, its being there could be of limited duration, but we suspend, suspend that understanding. The world, as that location, that institution or, or place of cultural activity, will change and continue in another way. This location in time provides temporary installations that texture of history, which is part of one's more immediate experience of them. There are other aspects to permanent installations which make them valuable in another way, but to understand both better, we must begin with the temporary. The point is that an installation work, even a temporary one, insofar as the experience of the work goes, is attached to a, to a location, is fixed, as part of the architecture and seals its fate along with the history and culture of that one location in the world. The implication being quite unlike the free floating object that transcends any particular place, finding its aura in the market on its way to the final resting place of the heavenly museum. It is the loss of the sense of self with modernist absorption which removes the viewer from the here and now and makes the experience of the fictive space of painting and sculpture even possible. Why installations are so intrinsically linked with this understanding of postmodernism is that their commitment to a location links them to the here and now and is yet discursively part of what makes them art. And as such, as art, they can do so while they remain in the world. One cannot hope to prescribe work having an engagement with questions concerning the production of meaning to always turn out results that are either well-designed and aesthetically pleasing along the lines of long-received criteria of attraction 
and market desirability, nor with any more or less likelihood should we expect a rigorous and prescriptive form of, physical, of visible uncanniness, of demonstrating an ugly or non-art graf, graf, uh, graf, gravitas sorry, to be part of the experience either. Such an insistence ultimately functions as a form of style. How one makes a work must be in the service of why it is being made. To that end, a work can look like anything at all, include, including not necessarily being visible at all, beyond the signifying needs inherent in how the work must manifest itself and what is required for it to construct the meaning that it does, how it looks really doesn't matter beyond its role in that requirement. Do, we do know that historically new art, when it is making a contribution to the history of ideas, often doesn't look like art. Driven primarily by artistic intention, such work, if judgment is the issue, must be judged by its own standards, those standards required for the work's reception, which permit it to be put into play culturally. The viewer-reader must also be armed, apparently, with the admonition that seeing isn't as simple as looking. This postmodern project, however, out of the process of an entomological-like formative historical path of growth within culture has internalized a carried over feature of modernism. This can be seen to be that art requires a self-definition, even if a continually transformatory one, to be put in play in the service of maintaining the recognition of itself, that of having a quality of transitory autonomy. This feature is a necessary one for art to be readable and meaningful in a given cultural and historical moment. This is the operative play of art. It's part of the nature of the dynamic of its own inherent cultural force to self-describe itself in relation to the world in which it finds itself, even if always in a way which is subject to revision by the practitioners of culture themselves who must embrace it. It is this internal drive of art toward implicit autonomy that provides its traction within the world. Art's ultimate refusal to participate with the world as a knowing partner within the context of other meanings, corporate, religious, entertainment, at all, is how it preserves and maintains its own particular, even if non-prescriptive character. Viral-like, viral -like, as Felix Gonzalez Torres put it so eloquently, art's paradoxical dialectic requires that it must take on the forms and meanings of the world of the living and borrowing freely as part of a dynamic of an interior order which protects its identity as something other than the world in order to make meaning for the living in the world. That which distinguishes the actual production of art from that of paintings by monkeys or the drawings of children is that intentional act manifesting a, kind, a specific kind of meaning, art, within human cultural and social meaning, one which necessitates an individual's intention of taking subjective responsibility for that act and without which such an activity can have no political life. Without such a pro profile of autonomy, art could never see itself. That is, it would lose its self-reflexivity and thus its capacity as a critical and political force within culture. Or as Gaston Bachelard put it, as soon as art has, be has become autonomous, it makes a fresh start. In this way, art manifests itself as a continual and dialectical new beginning. As part of its own autonomous spiral, it must be able to see itself, which also means to see the world in itself as it proceeds. This self-reflexive moment constitutes in culture the basis for its political life as a critical space and as a transformatory moment within its role as part of the production of consciousness itself. As it does so, Human intention takes on its role as a producer of meaning along with the subjective responsibility for having done so, and thereby anchors the cultural discourse of which it is a part to the historical moment in which it happens. It is this which gives art its authenticity, both in the present and for future generations. Now I'll show you a work of mine, mostly recent. Okay, this is the Sigmund Freud Museum where the one 25 years ago was done.
This was the first one I did at the museum in, um, in Lyon. It's now the Museum of the City. It was, had another name before. Um, you can slow down a little. For many years, if any of you know New York and know uh, the Leo Castelli Gallery, which is my gallery half my life, um, Leo Castelli had a big space on Green Street. And he was, it was a big space, and it was like, it cr I thought crushed almost every show that was there. So it kept saying, you've got to do something here. And I said, well, and I have the right work. So as I was putting up Leon, can you go back a minute? As I was putting, that's good. Um, I, one wall was up, and I got on the phone to Leo, and I said, Leo, I've got your show. But then I, anyway, you'll see it later, maybe. Okay, you can proceed. So, for those of you who didn't see the actual show here in Vienna, this is a few photos. If you compare it with the show upstairs, you'll see where it all comes from. <coughs> the, travel, the show traveled to um, the Palais de Bazaar in Brussels. And um, when we were doing the catalog, they sa I said, how many are you printing uh, in here in Vienna? And they, uh, they said, oh, 3,000. I said, are you kidding? You're going to need a lot more than that. But they said, Wittgenstein and Sarah Kassuth, it's not going to sell. So it sold out in four days. And so the show was up for four months without any catalogs to offer. Yes. <laughs> so this is in French and Flemish, because it's, it's Belgium. It was a lot bigger museum. And um, I found out what, it's, what museums go through. Slow down, please. Um, what the, they go through to, for lending, because Palais de Bazaar is a kind of kunsthalle. They have no collection. And museums really only want to bother giving works to museums that have a collection that they might want to borrow from later, right? There's no, there's no bounce back if a, a Kunsthalle. So I had to get on the phone and browbeat and arm twist these museum directors to loan, to loan me the works I wanted. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? Okay. Um, good. Why is the, the title comes after the first photo? We have a little technical problem we're trying to overcome here, you might have noticed. Okay, so this, I was invited um, to do this. Basically, this is the lobby of the Brooklyn Museum, which was an enormous, um, essentially ethnographic museum. Uh, after about 120 years as being that, at the turn of the century, they just changed the labels and it made it an art museum. Some of the same work being shown, which I found very fascinating. Anyway, they, they had this, this series of, they were funded, to do um, uh, exhibitions um, in the lobby of contemporary art. And they asked me if I would do one. I said, sure. And I said, can I use, do anything I want? And they said, yeah, absolutely anything. So I wanted to go into the collection, which had an amazing collection. I mean, it's uh, of, of everything, of all cultures. Um, and I figured out what to do. And I knew that it would be a difficult show. I had a model made in my studio, which is about a third the size of the stage with miniatures in it. And I called in the chief of the curators and each individual curator for each department. And we had a big meeting in my studio. And I had to sell them, essentially, because I knew it would be a lot more than $10,000. And so we figured it out. And in those days, uh, it was uh, you know 20 years ago, well, it was fi we figured out it would probably cost $50,000. And Bob Buck, who was the director of the museum, he said, well, I don't have the money for it. But if you will sign and take personal responsibility for deficit spending, we'll just go ahead and you, know, you can figure out how you raise your money later. I said, where do I sign? So we did it. And I went into all the different departments. This show was being funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, which was oppressing uh, work um, by, by uh, anything that had, it was sexual in nature, anything that was uh, connected gay or lesbian culture, shall we say, anything, you know, on and on, anything that was white Republicans wouldn't have liked, essentially. And um, slow down, please. 
The savage lives within himself, while social man lives constantly outside himself, and only known how to live in the, in the opinions of others, so that he seems to receive the consciousness of his own existence merely from the judgment of others concerning him. In the Shanshak Rousseau. So, um, this exhibition, um, I did the Brooklyn Museum, which was supposed to be kind of an, an insider uh, intellectuals, um, you know, a t contribution, ended up um, breaking all the attendance records in the museum. I was on CNN for a week in an interview that was repeated over and over. I had two big articles uh, in the New York Times, Arts and Leisure, front page, etc. It was my, my most popular show and in terms of like getting outside of the specialized art world kind of uh, audience. Um, and the point wasn't lost. That was the interesting thing. The show had a big effect politically. Th this show and one in Cincinnati got the, uh, the Congress actually to change their um, uh, oppressive, really, um, uh, requirements for funding for art projects. I showed here that things of historical interest and relevance, things that we really learn from, are about the, the, the texture of, of problematicity, things that cause problems, things that are scandals, things that are not the way they should be. I, if, um, are you just moving on? Please go back. What I'm talking about is what they're looking at. Thank you. Um, for example, uh, what you see through the doorway are um, paintings of nude children, more or less, including Larry Clark's portfolio called Teenage Lust. Well, uh, and, and Larry, there was a critic, I, I, there are texts from the time, who said, um, we know that uh, this, even if the children are naked, it cannot have any sexual implications because, of course, they're children. That was what I thought. Anyway, but um, then I had a lot of the things that was um, uh, reflective of Nazi, Nazi uh, aesthetic policies. Um, things that you'd be amazed that were on my way forbidden at the time. Okay, proceed. I'm showing this a little, it's not quite relevant, but I want to tell you something about it. These are works I did where I would take a cartoon, this is um, lines of neon behind and um, quotes from philosophers, but primarily, and the cartoon. If you get it. Ms. Jen Jenkins, would you please bring a round object into my office? Is what the cartoon says. Uh, slow down, please. And, um, this was at a show in LA, Gallery Club Margot Levin. I was arriving, traffic was terrible in LA, and I got to the middle of the opening. It was really crowded. And I, and I went in there, and there was um, immediately three Hollywood lawyers who were collectors of mine came running over to me. This is, by the way, decades before Coons, and said, Joseph, did you get permission to use those cartoons? And I said, No, I didn't. But I didn't get you know, permission from Mr. Hagel either. And he said, but that's not the point. I mean, you can't just take something and use it like this in an artwork. And I explained it to them this way. I pointed to that little gap, and I said, after, after I pointed to the cartoon, and I pointed to the text, I said, that cartoon is not my work. That text is not my work. My work is the gap between them. It's the surplus meaning that the two together generates. And that's what I take responsibility for. Those are just props to generate that surplus meaning. So I didn't think I was stealing anything. I said, I'm not in the donut business, I'm in the donut hole business. Anyway, that was humor. <laughs> Next. That was quick, but okay. Are we in a hurry up? <laughs> no, don't take speed up there in that office. It's been a very long three weeks from my assistant Antoinette. She can't wait to get this all over with, I can tell you.
Okay, I began doing these. I just studied. I was invited to in um, here in um, Austria, in Linz, to do a, to be an exhibition called Foreigners and Guests, and um, it was based on the philosophy of Hans Dieter Bahr, an Austrian uh, philosopher. So, uh, you can stop a second, um, and. It was fascinating, his theories, and it was about to do with the relationship between being a guest and being a foreigner. And um, I began to do a series of works. Um, I, I don't think they're in order, I don't think I have that many of them here, but the first one uh, I did was in Oslo. I, I was a Oslo, <laughs> Norway. It was a retrospective in the museum, and, um, and one, so that was on one side, and then the other two big halls. And <clears throat> so I, I dealt with the idea of Wittgenstein when he lived in Norway. <coughs> so, um, I was interested, you know, uh, the, in this idea of him being there, living, living in a little hut uh, in, a, on this, in a very desolate place. So, then I began, because I have other invitations to do shows. So, um, I was invited here to the uh, Irish Museum of Modern Art to do a retrospective, and it's, uh, th this museum is very beautiful, and it's, a, it's actually a, re uh, a copy of Les Invalides in Paris. And so all the old, and it was a hospital in the 18th, 19th centuries. So uh, all the rooms were, I had different parts of my retrospective in. But in the main hall, I did a guest and foreigner, and it had to do with um, Wittgenstein, who also spent a period of his life in, um, Ireland, and um, Joyce, who was out of Ireland, <laughs> famously. Um, and it was in Gaelic and English, because those are the two languages relevant to this. And um, I had a team of about, oh, 22 assistants, and we were working with um, vinyl, vinyl robots. And we worked from um, 9 in the morning to around 10, 11 at night for weeks, for a temporary show. It was completely insane. And um, you can see, you know, the things that were in play here. But um, sometimes it was our early use of this machine. And sometimes we'd get one hold done, and I had a team, you know, that would just had to do what we call weeders, who separated the positive letters from the negative background, or which, however, you want to see it. And with, after all that work, then I would sometimes say. I need it again, but three centimeters longer, you know, things like that. That's why I'm always loved so much by my staff. Okay, next. This was, uh, it was, I, I mentioned, uh, I think at the opening last night, Goethe birthday in Frankfurt, he was born there, and they came to me and they asked me if I would do a, an exhibition in honor of Goethe. And their concern had to do with, they, did, they wanted to do something that was, appropriate and dignified, shall we say, for, for Goethe, generating some actual new culture, rather than having it become Mozart Kugel or um, what uh, the Spanish tourist board has done with Miro. You know, this kind of thing is not really showing respect to these people who made an incredible contribution to one's culture. So I did this uh, based on Goethe's Italian journey, as Goethe experiencing being both a guest and a foreigner. Okay. This is an interesting uh, invitation. The cur and it's interesting because it was the curator in this occasion was is my curator here, Mario Codignata. And, he, and this is another, a little like the Castelli story. It's a, it, architecturally, I saw the photos of the previous artists in, uh, who worked and it was really crushed many of the works. So I decided you can't resist, a thought, you need to be a little Eastern to deal with this building. So I would go with it, of course. And so we don't resist and try to, you know, win uh, some battle with the architect. Um, so, but this was a quote by Benedetto Croce, um, and, and it was an enormous scandal for some reason. Well, it was Croce relativizing truth. And this seemed to upset a lot of people. The mayor of the city, um, who was actually there uh, because of the uh, support of the person who invited me uh, 
to do this um, with Mario. What, it was at the time the largest neon in terms of letter size I, I ever did. Um, but there were newspaper, newspaper articles uh, against it and one, some, a professor telling people to get stones and throw it at it and things like that. So um, there was a, uh, it was Berlusconi and there was a, a minister of, not a minister of culture, but a, the sub-minister in charge of art who was interviewed on, on Italian television and saying, so what do you think about the work of Kasuth in Naples? And he said, well, let me explain it this way. Three days ago, I had a meeting with the Pope, and I asked him what he thought of the work of Kasuth in Naples. And he said, he looked at me and he said, I do not support the work of Kasuth in Naples because it relativizes truth, which is what everybody was, of course, saying. Um, so anyway, my friends were all excited that I finally got a, after a couple of centuries, an artist finally got a Pope to get pissed off at him. Anyway. Next. Are you alive out there? Okay. This was an interesting invitation. Um, this was, this is a, the German parliament. Okay, slow down. And um, I, it was really uh, daunting. I mean, I'm not even German. And here I'm doing this thing. Uh, this is the office of, uh, this is the Braunfels building. And it's where all the members of parliament in Reichstag um, had their offices. And this, before 9-11, was supposed to, you know, there was the libraries there in the river, and you have big flights of stairs on the other end, and you could, you know, go through. Well, after 9-11, because of who, who was occupying the building, that you had to get permission, so that was unfortunate. But um, these are stainless steel letters, and on one side is a text by a writer uh, not known outside of the German-speaking reading world named Ricarda Hoch. And she was an historian. She was a feminist early. She was from, lived a long time in East Germany. Um, and uh, Thomas Mann said she was the greatest woman in Germany. Um, the, other, the other side is a text from Thomas Mann, Magic Mountain, and, uh, where he talks about the origin of life. And the text by Ricardo Hook is also talking about the origin of life. So you could see them walking one way or the other, and you could see them from the offices. I was the centennial artist for the Isid Isidora, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, an amazing woman who, um, she was A, of course, a rich socialite. But she was really an installation artist. She, if she'd been born another time, there was no doubt about it. She, she would, uh, and a man named Bernard, Bernard Berenson was sent to Europe with a camera, and he would photograph things. She was the first collector to choose from photographs. She would, uh, he would find things that he would tell her she sh he thought she should buy, and um, he went all over doing that, and she would buying things by through these photographs. Um, so I thought as a, um, as a centennial artist, I would do three things, three points in the creative process, of course. And the, the, the one is the um, next. This is another guest in Foreigners. I went into the collection and pulled works um, like Holbein and, you know, whatever they had around. Um, and it's put in place. It's a very tight one. It's quite specific for this place. So that was the one relationship to the creative process which was the collector. The other one was the vitrines. Now what you have to know is that she positioned everything really in a sometimes strange way and she really cared so much that she had in her will that if anybody ever moved, changed anything, all of the collection should be immediately sold and the money given to Harvard, a local university. Um, so there were these vitrines, and I, so, um, I had to work with a lawyer because, it, of course, nobody wanted me to violate that, so it was really rather insane to invite me into the place, but I managed to do it. And um, there were these covers on the vitrines of, of uh, various artifacts that she bought, and so I used that as another location. Um,
And then outside, there was a, a Whistler did a lecture of, uh, about collectors. <laughs> and it was a kind of warning about collectors. So um, I did a work based on his lecture. Next. And this goes around the, uh, the museum. It was temporary, of course. Nothing could be permanent because of uh, the will and everything. This is a show at my gallery in New York, Sean Kelly. And it's what you have there on, on glass was, was printed quotes from various French philosophers. This is kind of a history of French philosophy, actually. And, um, and then I made the various connections. I kind of like French philosophy in English. Go a little slower. Okay, um, Ilya Kavakov and I were invited um, to do an honor in, for Copenhagen in honoring Hans Christian Andersen. And um, when I was a little boy, I, my favorite story for children was The Emperor's New Clothes. And um, with great, with a certain amount of irony, when conceptual art came out uh, in my youth, um, the, a lot of the journalists were comparing me to uh, the, the emperor. And um, so um, it's as close to royalty as I've ever gotten. Anyway, it's, um, I was given a space uh, Ilya got there first, and he picked the one downstairs. But there was this gorgeous space upstairs, except there were no walls. And I decided, well, I'll do a carpet. And it turned out that there was an old carpet company that loved to support artist projects. So we got it made. Next. And what you have, it's two direct, in one direction, um, in Danish, is the whole story of the emperor's new clothes. And in the other direction, it's in English. Um, I had this, slow down please, go back. If I'm talking, that means I'm talking often about that. So if you just stay there until I change the subject, it makes it easier. She can't talk back, that's the interesting arrangement. <laughs> okay, um, what happened was that, we have to know about this, is that, um, Hans Christian Andersen wanted intellectual respectability. He craved it. Um, he wrote for children. He didn't get it. He, nobody took him very seriously as a writer in that, in that way. And then he heard that a man named Soren Kierkegaard was going to talk about his uh, writing in his next book. And he was just thrilled. Finally, he would get the recognition he wanted. Well, the book came out, and it was a damning critique. And it, 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 this upset him his whole life. So I just felt, what can I do for Hans on his birthday? So what I did is I went back and reread some of my Kierkegaard and looked for and pulled out things he said that could support the writing of Hans, sorry, Hans Christian Andersen. Um, and so what this, the little ones are like footnotes. Is, this is uh, uh, Hans Christian Andersen's, no, this is Hans Kierkegaard's quotes that I, that I removed and put in position. Uh, in relation to certain parts of the story. Um, I had an incredible thing happen, which was that the man, or the, the well, it's the, the Kierkegaard Institute that supports him and does the yearbook and uh, heard about it. We somehow got in contact and um, they invited me to write, they were having a big meeting of, of scholars, Kierkegaard and philosophers. And I said, great. So I would write about this for your yearbook, which was a great honor to be included. And so then, they, then we came with the idea that they would all come here, and they did. And they sat around in a circle on my carpet, and I gave my talk to them. And um, it was really uh, very enjoyable for me. This is the other work I did. This is the, the tower, and uh, if you've been to Copenhagen, you've probably seen it. Uh, it was a build, the building was built originally as a church, but was never used as a church. So the architecture is ecclesiastical, but it... So um, this is based on um, uh, two, diff two different things, which has to do with a self-portrait that 
that Anderson did um, uh, about himself and it's a kind of um, different aspects of him and things. And this is the interior. It's in Danish, of course. This is a work I did. Originally, it was done for um, the um, Hadrian's tomb in Rome. And they had a, an exhibition, actually, by the Archdiocese and the chief rabbi and of some uh, Buddhist organization. They were doing a show called God. Well, unfortunately, they changed the title, but it was a great working title. And um, so I took the word, I, I calculated the, the tourists who would come through this place. And um, so this is the word meaning in all of these different languages. Blue being um, the first color that we can recognize as humans. And of course, Giotto had a lot to say about it. This is a work, it's interesting work. It's, in a courtyard, so it's in the museum, but it's actually outside. It's a mosaic, computer cut, but a mosaic. This is um, one of the best galleries in Italy, which was originally a foundation, um, but there's not that big a difference. It's, it's a foundation in which work gets sold, <laughs> basically. And, um, but it's a very important project, uh, project um, Benedetto Spalletti is doing, and it's um, the, the most significant cultural, I think, uh, spot on the Adriatic coast of Italy. I can't talk endlessly about each one or you'll be here far later than they're going to let me. So, This is a, 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 a curated, more curated than other shows I've done, uh, but uh, definitely an installation. I had an amazing experience, which was that I wanted, I wanted this, this Magritte, of course, but it's in a museum, it's just a gallery you can't really borrow. Galleries can't really, maybe a Gaussian can, but most galleries can't really borrow from a museum. And so I, I happened to know the guy who's the head of the Magritte uh, Foundation. Harry, his name is. Anyway, he, um, slow down, can you go back, please? And I'm telling a story about this, that's why we would want it up there. Um, and I said, that's really a pity, I really wish I could get this painting, and he said, oh, he said, well, um, Magritte, Oh, by the way, he's the grandson of Magritte's chauffeur. There were no other members of the family. He inherited everything Magritte in the world. He's in he, he controls. But he's a very nice guy. And um, I, you know, I'm quite smart and amusing. And, well, anyway, I told him my problem. He said, listen, he said, Magritte put in his papers that he would like someone, sign painters, to take one of his paintings and blow it up and uh, in a room, and we just decided we would never do that. But now that you've asked, okay, and I'll give you a certificate from the museum that whenever you want, you have the permission to do that, and you have a Magritte. Well, unfortunately, my studio in London has brick walls and no space for it, so, but one day I'm going to have one in my home. But meanwhile, I did it here in Paris, This is a work by Seamus Farrell, who um, was uh, in charge of the installation upstairs. Most, most of my assistants are artists. This is my Guarini arc. Um, I did a, a I, I wanted, to, I was, doing some reading about labyrinths, mazes. I, so I decided to turn the gallery into one. 
even using up some part of the, some of the offices and everything. It was enormous. Um, and, I, and it was a kind of um, um, a sort of guest and fours and a retrospective at the same time. Slow down, please. I mean, these are works from mine from the 60s mixed with recent ones, and all put in play. See that over there on the right side? That was my zero knot I did at the Whitney Museum uh, wallpaper that I framed with one of them. This was a short body of work I did where I took paintings of Mondrian and uh, there's quotes by Mondrian in the, in the forms. So this is another show in Paris. Um, okay. What, the, what you see, I went in and I found photographs of the personal libraries of philosophers. And then, um, these aren't light boxes, they're just, the, it's like the work with the cartoon. It's open in the back, they're just lines of neon to illuminate it. Um, and uh, this, for example, is Wittgenstein's uh, bookcase. They're quite different ones. And um, So I was invited to um, Grand Canaries to, to do a show at the, at the museum, which is the Museum of Contemporary Art there. And then while I was there, I was looking around and I found these other interesting museums. So by the time I, you know, by the time it came for me to do something, I did something in three museums. One was the, um, I don't know if there's a photograph of it though, so, but there was one was the uh, Museum of, um, Columbus, but it was a, they have a big collection of maps made before uh, Columbus, and um, and it was called uh, what was it called? Basically, I wanted them to show America before no to show the globe, and the first globe ever was it was in it uh, to show the globe before there was an America. Because at that point, we were been in the Iraq war for quite a while, and there was America fatigue globally, Bush fatigue too. But, um, so I thought this would be a kind, a kind gesture by an American artist. This is guest and foreigner. The uh, languages I added there were the, were the, language, uh, the languages of the uh, flotilla of people from Africa who would make it as far as, um, uh, you know, as, far as the Canary Islands. And so, I want to include them in the reading. So this is the uh, this is the island where during the diaspora uh, of Armenia, and they were afraid all the culture, all the artifacts of great value to the Armenian people would be lost. So. Uh, uh, Italy uh, gave them this island, and it became the repository of all the, their artifacts, incredible things there. And the man who owned, who, um, it was a, a, an order, a religious order, Mekhtari is the man's name, and he was the one who wrote the first Armenian dictionary. So th they do contemporary shows, unrelated, I mean, I'm not Armenian, and uh, I think uh, Kunelis did a show, and he's not Armenian either, so they just like to do interesting shows every now and then. Um, so I, this was what I did, and it, what it, I, said, I took was the etymological links between, uh, for the word water, between Armenian, Italian, and English. So this is the etymological chart. Um, as you see, both whiskey and vodka come from the word water. I've been doing a lot of research on these two subjects. Um, well, you got no sense of humor, do you? What? 
Okay. So, I, and it's in it's in Armenian, English, and and Italian, Italian because we're on Italian soil, uh, English because the artist is English, and the, the all and big percentage of the art tourists coming to the Viennale also have English, and Armenian, of course. I was invited to a really interesting cultural center. They do exhibitions. Patti Smith did a concert there. I mean, they do all sorts of things. Um, you can put the slide up. And um, I, I, I thought the show should be about people who speak Spanish, read Spanish, work in Spanish, but are not Spanish. So it had to do with all of the places, Mexico and um, South, South America and all the islands that are Spanish-speaking. And um, I went through and I essentially wrote a paragraph by taking parts of books of uh, four Spanish writers. And um, there's an order, et cetera. It's a little hard, you know, in a photo to get it. Um, it was up for about a year, I think, this work. Um, and in the inside, I did an exhibition in which I invited, um, I don't remember how many, like 10, I think, or 12, uh, emerging artists not, that weren't known. And um, they would divide, um, they would write a paragraphic description, like uh, uh, instructions, how to make one of their works. And so they would do this, give this to one of the other artists, younger artists, and that artist would have to make um, you know, this work according to the instruction, and the same thing back again. So um, you had works that were, um, you know, uh, it, it was really a question about where, it's, the show is called Located Work. So where's the work, you know, is it in the physical, you know, because a lot of the things were very interpretive, of course. Anyway. So this is a permanent work on the facade of the Moderna Museum in Stockholm. This is, uh, Rauschenberg wrote, wrote it out on the, the logo. This is a, t uh, can you go back? Because it, it, it was, thank you. Um, so what you see on the outside, it's on the other side is the main hall of the, of the collection. And so those, they're, they're back to back. I did this work, I, don't, I guess we you don't have the photo we showed, of it originally for when uh, Stockholm was cultural capital of Europe. Um, I don't remember the year. It must have said it on the label, but um, all right. For the Edinburgh Festival, uh, they always have one big art exhibition, and the, they had a couple this time. I had one of them, and um, this was in an amazing space, which is called Fox Talbot. Don't move the slide, please. Um, and it was where uh, Darwin began his studies, and in those vitrines where my work is were stuffed animals, and uh, it was a you know, library. Now it's the it's Edinburgh University's uh, uh, art gallery. And I went into, and what this is, work is about, is about really Nietzsche's relationship to Darwin. And um, the drawings, these were drawings by Darwin that we found at Cambridge University. The scholars on Darwin have no idea what they mean, which made them perfect for my use. Um, so it's a sketch. You'll get some idea of it. it. I did a Chinese version for the Shanghai Biennale, which should be coming up. And there was also an exhibition of it in, um, in Sydney at uh, my gallery there, Anna Schwartz. This is the Chris Nietzsche. All right, this is my work at the Louvre, which is up now if you go to Paris. It's going to be a permanent work. Um, it's well, essentially, what you see here is the bottom of the original Louvre Palace. So those are 12th century walls. And when they built the pyramid, they did all this digging and they found this, they didn't know they had it. Um, so they, of course, um, used it. And so the people visiting the Louvre go through there and they get sent off to different wings, if you want to see, you know, 18th century Italian art, you want to see. 
Egyptian, whatever. Um, so I, they, I, I, I got the whole thing. And it's very, very long. This is just a few slides. Um, I think something like, I should remember, but 14 different works going and ranging from eight meters up to about 12 meters, maybe. And it's all about, um, can you slow down, please? It's all about, um, it happened. The work I showed you before with Dar the Darwin and Nietzsche work, well, I had a residency in Edinburgh to figure out what I was going to do. But I also had this invitation to do this thing in the Louvre. So I ended up um, sitting there in Edinburgh thinking about the Louvre. There was, the Brooklyn Museum contacted me and they said, listen, there's this new thing from the internet and they want to do a test with it. And so they asked if they could choose an artist, and you know, known artist, that would send these things um, you know, to them, and they would be able to, to read it. And um, something called tweets. And um, so I had to do them a certain amount of length or whatever. So I was sitting there, and I had to write, um, uh, I do it for a couple of weeks. And so I ended up doing, I did, I think, I think it's 14. And uh, so I was stood, imagine standing in front of that wall, and I began to ask questions about it to myself. and. and um, and that's, so at the end of all these twitterings, I uh, looked at it and I said, my God, I just did my show at the Louvre. So then the hard part came, which was uh, we dealt with something like seven scholars at three universities on four continents to get the exact, most exact, because it's not exact, French translation of my English, right? And that was the hard part, and that took weeks really a lot longer than my doing the work, long time more. Um, this is the last one. You get to see a long view of the last one. Okay. All right, then I, I, I'm invited to Melbourne. Uh, the, the museum contemporary out there is called Aka. And um, the director, uh, Juliana Ember, takes me into this, what happened? Why is that up? <laughs> All right, fine. I'll tell you that in a little bit. This, um, this is the, a kind of prelude. Um, I, did, I did my gallery in uh, Italy, um, uh, as well as working with Benedetta Spalletti. I've worked with Leah Roma from her first show in 1972 or something. So we've, we've gone the distance together. Um, but it's based on Beckett. Now Beckett, I really, we need to, I, we need to move on to, to get the order right. We need to go to uh, the Aka installation. There we are. Okay, so Juliana takes me into this room, and I, it, um, I can't quite see what the shape of the room is. I mean, I assume it's a, it's a rectangle, uh, but it wasn't. It's an amazing room. And um, there was a Jenny Holzer show on, uh, who I uh, was supporting when she was unknown and stuff. So. That's, that's all very simpatico. But um, next thing, uh, I'm standing there and um, I'm thinking of Beckett. I don't know why. And I'm thinking of um, waiting for Godot. Uh, so I decided I'd do that, work on that. So what you have here are fragments from waiting for Godot, as well as from another very obscure uh, writing, uh, a book of his writings called uh, Text for Nothing. And it's a juxtaposition of these different texts. And then there's that thing I'll show you when, when that slide comes up. So the, the front of the neon is, is dipped in black. So wherever you see it from, it, it, it's, it changes a lot. OK, stop there, please. Um, this is a painting uh, which Beckett felt uh, he says it inspired him, and it's called, it's um, Caspar David Friedrich, and it's uh, two men looking at the moon. And there were three paintings, three versions. Nobody knows which was the original one. So um, I reproduced it in black and white and changed the size according to my needs, and um, illuminated it. Okay, next. This is the smallest one. 
because the other invitations were really big places. Um, but it looked, it, it's the biggest gallery in New York, so it's also not small. But um, it was kind of weird as a gallery show. But I wanted to show it at home as if I feel toward that city, even if I live in London or Rome. But I was invited by the like, equivalent of the State Department of, uh, of the Netherlands to do a work. They have all these buildings, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century buildings, that they began to add to, um, uh, to make the, have to have sufficient uh, headquarters space. And so I, uh, was, I got this commission to do a work, and I, I picked a text of um, Spinoza. Um, which was germane to what the buildings were used for. And you see them, they sort of bring, they sort of pulled together somewhat um, these buildings. The Queen lives nearby. This is a gallery show. I did also uh, the Venice Biennale, but this is my, the one I did in London, it's my favorite version. So. So basically, it's a drawing, a one-to-one -one drawing of the of the of the room it's in, it's application wallpaper, um, uh, but I, everything was um, ten centimeters off. So otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see the drawing, right? So I had to do it like that. And um, these are all quotes germane to architecture, germane to um, drawing, also. So I have a, there's a famous man in Japan called Johnny Walker. It's really Johnny Waka, but he calls himself Johnny Walker, like the whiskey. And um, he's an incredible person uh, who does a lot for art in, in Japan. Uh, he speaks 14 languages, and he was born in like Uzbekistan. But um, he, uh, in Japan, of course, there are three generations of Japanese, a Japanese passport. But of course, he, um, he is, shall we say, has not really made himself part of the community as, as much as one might think, given that. So he is, loves dogs. He's obsessed with dogs. And so um, Ai Weiwei was supposed to do this, and he got uh, occupied with other things. And so uh, he asked me if I would do it. And so this is a house he built. It's made by um, Japanese uh, carpenters who make bathhouses. And it's essentially a big dog house. Um, and so I did all sorts of quotes, some serious, some amusing, about dogs, and it covers the place, which in Japan is a little bit, it's quite strange. And it's, of course, in English and Japanese. That's the inside. So this is the Beckett Festival. I was there. They asked me to, to, to do, I had kind of finished, but they said, please do a, one last one for us. Um, and, it, and it was the first Beckett Festival. And I've since become an, an, an artist associated with the festival and proposed things Beckett related. Um, this was, you know, one of the more simple uh, presentations of this work. I donated one to the town of Inniskillen. Inniskillen, by the way, is where a kind of posh Protestant boarding school called Portala is. And Oscar Wilde went there, and, and Beckett went there. Um, and this is a future project we're working on now. If anybody here would like to have their name on the wall, um, it's. Uh, so we're looking for sponsors. <laughs> and uh, so this is, a, of course, a mock-up. Um, it's, it's, it's essentially, this is half of the building. There are four towers that are like open books. That was the architect's idea. And so for that reason, I have the text on the inside. But there's so much space between them that you, you can see it, parts of it at a time, depending where. 
they, and the, the scary part of the story is they say that because of the size, that for the half of Paris that can't see the Eiffel Tower, they'll see my work instead. So, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night worrying I'm going to ruin the Paris skyline. Not something you want to do, really. This is a test I did for the Nuit Branche, and um, we had 5,000 people. That was quite astounding. Uh, not for me, for Nuit Branche, but I took credit anyway. Not a laugh ever. You guys are hopeless. I'm glad I'm not a comedian. Yeah, why well, this is here, I'm not sure, but. Uh. Well, it was my first time to be in a show in China, so it was kind of exciting. And I thought Nietzsche in Chinese was too good to resist. This is from Finnegan's Wake. Uh, each the relation the. Basically, I wide, uh, wide out parts of the page, most of the page, and these are the parts. So their relation to each other is how they are in the original publication. And it turned out that the, back, the partner of the gallerist, who I, I knew her for a long time, she was a very important critic there who decided to open a gallery, but um, he's a publisher of Joyce in Turkey, just by total serendipity. Um, and they just finished publishing Ulysses in Turkish. And I asked for a dozen to give out his Christmas presents. I mean, it's the one thing no family should be without. All right. I, I, this is a show I had in Berlin um, last winter. It's a kind of, it's neon works from different periods of my life. And um, it's um, coming to London in November. It'll be different, of course. I picked other works and I'll have, and the architecture is different. Pink one is upstairs. Works are always unique, one in, 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 in the color, the basic seven colors of neon. Okay, this is interesting. It's a Paris gallery. She specializes in emerging artists from Africa and the Middle East, which I thought was a really great thing to do. And, one of, and, and occasionally an artist in the gallery, one of the younger artists, chooses an older artist that they have learned a lot from, and they do a, a two-person show. So um, I did that. Mine's work's in the bottom half. His work is in the upper half. And um, I took um, f the, from the, the, the Le Tanger by, by Camus, The Stranger. Um, I worked with that book. And, the, and along with The Etymology of Light. That's um, silk screen on glass and some neon. This is a permanent um, uh, exhibition of mine that, that the museum is doing. They've sort of given me the museum. And they will build, they're building a separate room, a separate building, I mean, uh, for temporary shows of other artists. And this will work outside. This is. Um, it's a, a monastery, former monastery, I should say. Cartouche monastery. So there was a, they just put up works of different years uh, for the. And that's it, folks. How'd we do? Turn it off, please. 
Everything, everything's all self-evident and you don't have any questions, right? I have a question. I'm, next time I'm going to hand out liquor when I give, when I give a talk in Vienna. So maybe you guys laugh a little more at my jokes. Yes. Um, thank you for coming to Vienna, Austria. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Can we put on the house lights so I can see my speakers? Do you mean by contracting it out that it will be produced by somebody? Like, by you, a, like you, a metal? Okay. And I'm wondering how do you structure your contracts um, with galleries, your proposals? How do you get them to let you do these awesome, huge productions? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, distracted because I want them to turn on the lights and I don't know why it's so difficult. You don't have lights. <laughs> well, there's a bit of a paradox. It's darker now. That isn't what I asked. <laughs> we could all take out our lighters like in a football game. What? There we go. Good. Back there, there's no lights, huh? They've seen enough of me. It's them I want. All right. Okay, um, sorry, so I'll go back to what you were saying. Well, um, you know, this is something that builds up incrementally throughout the course of your career. I mean, uh, I had, I don't know, something like 28 shows before I was 25. So, I, you know, I got started really early. And, um, and also I was a, a very fortunate to be at uh, Leo Castelli, which was probably, arguably, the best gallery in the world. And I, I was showed there when I was 24 to begin with. And that was, uh, gave me a lot of um, traction with other places to get them to, you know, go off on the limb to, to do my projects with me. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's, uh, you know, one doesn't really know how this stuff happens, but, um, you know. The important thing is that it does. Not a satisfactory answer. I do apologize. Um, what would you recommend is like, I mean, like I'm, I'm writing contracts and I work with artists and work in the interior as well. And it seems like you're doing that with other artists' work. That's really awesome. Um, <clears throat> uh, any other secrets? I mean, what, what makes people like what you do? Like, do you think about that? Or do you just, just well, speak to yourself? You know what gives it some validation, or I don't know what, gravitas, is that, you know, when you, st it's very personal. I mean, that's kind of the interesting thing. When you do something, I mean, I started working with texts, started working with photography. When I was, when I first did like one of three chairs, um, there, nobody was doing using photography like that. I mean, they'd been used like, you know, earlier in the century, Man Ray and Davidus and stuff. But, and, and Rauschenberg and, and Warhol had used photo um, silk screens. But they were still on canvas and they still looked like paintings and, and they were acceptable for those reasons. So to have a photographer come in and take a photo of a chair, because I didn't want to take the photograph, or these people would think, I'm a photographer, right? Um, so it was, um, <coughs> new art always has to teach people another way of looking at art in general, you know? And then, you know, when other people got into, started doing work like it and all that, and the sort of art movement, there was something you could call an art movement, evolved. Um, it gives you credibility, I guess. Um, and, um, yeah. But uh, really, uh, I think that there is, um, People are get con convinced by your passion about your own work, you know, and they 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 trust it. It's not for money. It's nothing cynical about it. It's not just you know, and you know, it's in a world in which a lot of that other stuff goes on. Um, it's kind of 
partly why one could love art. Yeah. Which is why it's a great pity now that the market is really starting to dominate conversations about art. It's a great pity. So artists really have to fight it. You have to fight corporate culture, you have to fight this mentality and, and not let your work be defined by um, you know, the market. Easy for me to say because you know, I, I started when I started and it was a lot smaller art world and I could convince a big percentage of the art world that this weird stuff I was doing was art because of that. Um, but, the, they were, but, every, but people were a lot more serious about art. Now we have a lot of people in the art world who are in it for really non-art reasons. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Next. So, so what is the art reasons then? What, so say what again? are your art reasons then? If you say... Well, you mean after all this, you have to ask that question? Oh, listen, you have to know, uh, there, I think there's probably quite a few artists. Can I see a show of hands on how many of you in the audience are artists? Yay, okay. <laughs> Don't worry about the fact that you sometimes stand in the middle of your studio or your bathroom that's your dark room or whatever and worry that you might be a fraud. Artists always have the secret thinking that they're going to get found out, that they're an absolute fraud. And, um, and so the thing is, as you get older, you get more and more convinced, partly because the world believes you're not a fraud. They actually come to your openings. They actually like your work. They even buy it. They put it in museums. You know. And the more and more that happens, um, you kind of finally get convinced, you know, I'm not really a fraud after all. This is the, the joy of being an older artist. You get to actually make the work and, and have that really great time doing it and, um, and actually have your life paid for it. It's, you know, it's worth it. It's worth the struggle you're going through. So don't give up. Question. You're a long ways away and... I have a process-based question. Okay, good. And I always said I was the mother, but anyway. <laughs> And I, I can be very uh, focused about when I'm looking for a certain thing. I mean, I must have gone, well, in the 80s when I did all those works, there's a room of works I did in the 80s. I mean, some books like Interpretation of Dreams, I must have read 20 times. But I read it, it's a reading for, you know? As Levi Strauss says in The Savage Mind, history is always history for. It was a it was purposeful way of studying. And, um, and so I look, at a, I, look, I look at a text looking for certain kinds of things. And it's a very weird form of, of an education, I have to say. I went to, I mean, I went to art school, but I, I also went to study anthropology and philosophy. Um, but I, you know, I always, um, uh, how can I say this? There was a certain uh, appreciation of what, there was something about the New York art world that was dumb as hell. And it sort of pissed me off, you know, that somehow everybody thought it was okay to not know th things. And so I um, made a point to try to, um, to know things. Uh, at a certain moment, my, I was like a guy in the middle of a big so-called career, and I realized one day that I was a Euro Eurocentric, that includes America and Europe, a Eurocentric male white artist, that my frame of reference was a bubble. So, and I, and I got to that point in the, by reading the late uh, Wittgenstein, the, the so-called anthropological Wittgenstein, a named, man named Peter Wendt, who was uh, an anthropologist influenced by him. Um, and, um, 
that was part of it. Part of it, um, you know, there were a couple d different influences. And I went, and so I decided I needed to go, and I went to graduate school and I studied uh, what's, what's called philosophical anthropology. And it was basically an idea, this is at the New School in New York, and it's an idea of a line that goes from Vico to Rousseau to Marx. And so all my, you know, uh, Anglo-American language philosophy that I had, you know, really totally was into um, from my late teens on, um, all of a sudden, you know, I was on the continent and I was, you know, seeing things in a different way. Um, but, you know, I had great, uh, it was uh, another page turned, you know, and that in my, I had other things I could use to influence me. I read a lot, although I have to say a lot of my reading um, um, is escapist fiction. It's, uh, like, it's equivalent to what they call dream need, except I read to escape in a certain way. Um, but about the mother and father of conceptual art, I always remember a really great line by Germaine Greer in, in the 70s. She said, Freud is the father of psychoanalysis. It had no mother. And I thought that was incredibly, listen, you're breaking up, you're rolling in the aisles? No, but that is a, both very humorous and really kind of apropos to um, this, this uh, anyway, yes. Say it again louder, please. Would you rather me do it in something? I could redo it all. What would you propose? Why are you still using neon light bulbs? Okay, I, other ways of, because they are not really contemporary and you always talk about the new oh. art. And there would be several other ways to make big letters. That's right. And, and, then, and then, then try to figure out the difference between them and the ads. But listen, let me explain to you. I, I, at the very beginning, and, and I didn't show early work here, so, but, so you might not know of it, but um, I chose Neon because I needed something. Uh, I did this works which were meant to be tautologies. That is, they were totally self-referential. So uh, the one well-known work is, it has Neon Electrical Glass English 8 or whatever, you know. And, and so I needed something with a lot of qualities that I could separate to be able to make this work. And at that time, there, there was the first, there was a neon, or a Czech artist in 1914 who did sort of abstract shapes of neon. Neon was, hadn't been around long. Um, but basically, there, um, there wasn't that much neon in the art world. There was um, Flavin, but Flavin is seen uh, as fluorescent lights from the offices, et cetera, are not associated with neon, although in Europe they are, because there's not a big technical difference, but they're experienced quite differently. But basically, the neon was not used up. It was not you th thought of as art. Oil paint, canvas, that's rich, shall we say, a wash in meaning before you ever do one little anything as an artist. It's, so it's almost impossible to do anything with it. But signage was, all, was neon. And so it was from popular culture, as, in a sense, as signage. And it had a lot of these qualities. And, um, so for me, it was, uh, it was good, and I liked it, and I still like it. I'm not for everything. I would say maybe 40% of my work is in neon. People think of a neon artist, but no. Because you know, that's very modernist thinking. It's, you know, it's not about the, me the medium. I use neon because it's, you know, it's uh, handy. Um, I do a lot of other things, too, that uh, are also, you find letters and texts and things made with. It's not, you know, you can make it important if you want, but then you'll be missing understanding the work. Yeah, somebody else? Yes. Uh, can I have a microphone? Microphone. Well, um, I have a dream, and I hope that my dream is not too stupid for you. But my dream is to see one day in the middle of Vienna, in the heart of Vienna, near the St. Stephen's Cathedral, in the, sorry, in the underground, a big installation from you, and I think this would be worldwide the very... I didn't catch I where know. you wanted it. Do you think it's stupid? No, but where, where's the place? Well, it's like Stevens Cathedral in the underground. The oh, that's in the, the underground, uh, in that kind of an underground. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Do you think so it's I've always, I felt, I was, you know, always part of the underground, but this is another one, okay. 
not stupid at all. Have, have your sponsor call me. <laughs> no, I, um, when I did the show at the Shern, I did something, um, but it wasn't in neon. But I did a work in, the, in, the, uh, in Frankfurt, uh, in, the, in the underground. And I did one in Milan, a big project um, uh, in the underground. Some years, I completely forgot about that work. Make a note, find photos. I don't even remember. Uh, I need Freud installation, uh, Freud installation, of course. Uh, even, yeah. Well, I'm not really working with Freud. I try to, like, you know, move along, learn something new. Um, I, I continue to be very interested in Freud, of course, and I have my relationship with the Sigmund Freud Museum, and that's ongoing. But um, there's, you know, the, the period in which I was doing the Freud work was quite intense, and it was over 10 years, so I kind of, um, you know, to go back, it would be something else. I'm not saying it's impossible, but, you know, but thanks for the invitation. I'll give you my card after. I'm looking for sponsoring, yes? Yeah, that's your first thing. That's more work than the work. Okay, you're all satisfied? I've answered all your questions? Okay, what is it? Give her the microphone. At the beginning of your talk, you were uh, speaking about an object uh, consisting of two halves. One is the concrete and one would be the vir virtual one. And ah. I was wondering about the notion of concrete in your work and if you could uh, elaborate that in the, the notion of concrete, did you say? Yes. Well, it's um, one of those uh, kinds of conversations that's very context dependent. However, there is no context uh, when, you, when it takes the form of a question. It's floating in the air, you know. So it's hard just to know. I, I, you know, there are many things, of course, that you can speak of. Um, in the air, um, most theory and one kind of is like that. But um, I think it's not without paradox um, to talk about the concrete in in the air. <laughs> All right, um, I think I've had it. How do you guys feel? <laughs> I spoke an hour to the. Um, a, a, a visiting group, some of you may be here, uh, from the Vienna Secession. So I've been at this now, and I talk a lot, and I talk a lot already. Too much, too much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>